you're going to see. <laughs> Lift your Bibles and let's make our confession of faith together. I am unconditionally loved by God and at harvest. I come to him just as I am, but I won't stay as I am because the message I'm prepared to receive will make me more like the great I am. I am blessed and I am favored in Jesus' name. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're going to look at several scriptures tonight. Somebody say several. So it's important that you keep your Bibles or your tablets or your phones or whatever you have. You keep that with you. I'm going to do tonight uh, New Jack City Part 2, and I want to dive deeper into the principles we learned, and then I want to introduce a brand new principle to you from the movie. Look at your neighbor and say, this is going to be good for us. Come on, talk to him. Say, this is going to be good for us. Now, Jesus talked with stories that illustrated principles, which were called parables. And in this series, we're using movies as our parable to illustrate biblical principles. Now, in part one of this movie, did anybody learn some stuff from part one? All right. We, we looked at four different principles uh, uh, from this movie, New Jack City, which is about the rise and fall of a New York City drug lord, uh, Nino Brown, played by Wesley Snipes, at the hands of Scotty Appleton, played by Ice-T. And tonight I want to review those and, as I said, add one. Now, uh, just as another disclaimer, if you've never seen this movie, this is not a movie for you to pull your family and children together around on Friday night and have popcorn and watch. This is a grown folk only movie. Somebody say grown folks only. All right, now watch this, but please understand, we, there's good principles in this movie, and we're going to move in that. The first principle I gave you was this. We're in a new era. Say we're in a new, say we're in a new, excuse me, era. Say new era. Come on, talk to me. Say new era. Uh, an era is, by definition, a span of time with distinct change. Your life is lived by eras. Uh, uh, historically, there is eras. They refer to as ages. Uh, they'll call it the uh, technological age, the industrial age. Really, what they're saying is this is an era of time that was marked by this distinctive change. Your life has been that way. If you look back in the history of your life, you have had various eras in your life. Maybe it was the era of foolishness. Maybe it was the era of confusion. Maybe it was the era of junk and drama. Maybe it was the era of what you used to be, and now you're in the area of who you're becoming. Look, but, but, but say era. Now, now, please understand, when recruiting Scotty to take down Nino, Scotty's commanding officer said, we've got a new Jack City and we need a new Jack cop. And he was saying, we're in a new era. Say new era. And when Jesus came, I told you, he announced that he had begun a new era. It was the era of the kingdom. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. Say repent. Now, now repent means to change your mind and stop wasting time. Somebody say, change my mind. Stop wasting time. You've got to stop living life as if you don't have to give an account for it one day. Everything going on in your life, you're going to have to stand in front of God one day, and he's going to ask you about everything you did, every way you spent your time, everything that you did. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to have that meeting go well. I want him to look at me and say, well done, that good and faithful servant. Instead of, what in the heaven are you doing up here? You're here too early, but you live so sloppily you got here before your time. Say, new era. Now, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, change your mind, stop wasting time, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means it's in reach. Say, in reach. Jesus was saying, y'all have heard about the kingdom for thousands of years, but you didn't have the power to possess it because there was separation. But Jesus said, when I came, he was the bridge that got us from wilderness into promise. He was the bridge that got us from Egypt into Canaan. He was the bridge from just existing to living. He was the bridge to the kingdom. That is the reason why the cross stretches out, because it's a bridge. Say it's a bridge. He was saying, who I said you can be and what I said you can have are in reach now. So that's the kingdom. Now, kingdom, you understand, is heaven's attributes on earth, God's MO. And uh, I made it real simple for you a few weeks ago. Who God says you are and what God says you can have. Now, to have that, you have to do what you're told. The kingdom does not come just because you're a Christian. Which is why there are many Christians that know church but don't ever possess kingdom. There are many Christians that never possess who God says they can be and what God says they can have. And so subsequently, all they do is live to die. And when they die, God says, what in the heaven are you doing up here? Because you didn't do anything I sent you there to do. You didn't solve problems. You made them. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to have that be my testimony. When I stand in front of God, he's going to say, son, every problem I sent you to earth to fix, you fixed it. Every situation I sent you to earth to handle, you handled it. Touch your neighbor and say, I will not die like a chump 
Chump is an urban colloquialism, meaning a punk. A punk is one that doesn't do what they can do because they're scared to do it because nobody in their bloodline has ever done it. But you, you are the interruption to the dysfunction of your bloodline. You are the curse, but I'm going to keep speaking it until everybody in our church is in it. So you better get used to me saying it. You are the curse breaker. You are the history maker. You are the line crosser. You are the boundary breaker. Touch your neighbor and say, you are. Now, to have the kingdom, who God says you are, what God says you can have, you have to do what you're told. Now, Deuteronomy 6.23 says this. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land. Now, this means kingdom for us. Say kingdom. Of which he swore to our fathers. Look at me, Harvest. There's stuff that the generations before you were supposed to possess, but they didn't. And they died, watch this, miserable, full of days, but out of time. You missed what I said. There's people in your bloodline that have died full of days, but they were out of time. I'm going to say it again. There's folk in your bloodline that died, and they had many more days left in them, but they were simply out of time. Because the scripture says our days are numbered, which means the clock is counting down, which means you've got to stop living so passively. You've got to stop living like it doesn't matter what you're doing because the clock is on the countdown. And I don't know about you, but I want to die empty. I don't want to die full of days. I want to have accomplished everything I was sent here to accomplish. Look, he says, of which he swore to our fathers, which means they didn't get it. Say, they didn't get it. Say, they didn't possess it. All right, which means, watch this, God says, it's now been stored up for you. See, you know about your generational curses, but I'm going to tell you, there's some generational blessing that's been stored up for you that the generations before you were too stupid to take, but you the interruption. So touch your neighbor and say, I'm getting mine. Now let's quantify that. What is mine? Who God says you are, what God says you can have. Now look at verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Let's look at that verse. And the Lord commanded us to do what we're told. Statutes were slightly different than the law. I don't have time to get into it. But statutes simply meant God said, I want you to follow the protocol. Say protocol. Say order. He says, I want you to follow the protocol. I want you to follow the order because if you follow it, look at what it says. It's for your good always. You may not understand it now, but you don't understand a lot of stuff. So, you know, you ever had somebody say, well, why we got to do that? Well, it's a lot of stuff you don't know why you got to do, but you do it anyhow. Why you got to be so long to get ready? Now, we don't have an answer for that, but you just still do it. Say order. It's for my good. All right, which means on your job, there's an order. In the church, there's an order. And wherever you're at, there's an order. And God says that order is for your good. And I give you that order so that you can be who I said you uh, could be and that you can have what I said you could have. You break the order, I'm not giving you nothing. Pretty simple, right? All right, so look at your neighbor. That's pretty simple. All right, now, the question is, he said, that he might preserve us, in verse 24, us alive as it is this day. And I told you this in part one, how he preserved them. Hosea 12, 13, by a prophet, say, man of God, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. How'd they come out of Egypt? A man of God. How are you going to come out of your junk? A man of God. How are you going to come out of your stress and struggle? A man of God. How are you going to come out of debt? A man of God. How are you going to come out of bondage? A man of God. How are you going to come out of depression? A man of God. That's been his system forever, and it's going to keep being his system. You can't break his system because that's the way it T.I. is. So for all the people who you got friends, well, I don't go to church, I don't need nobody, that's why they stuck. That's why they broke, that's why they jacked up, because they don't have a man of God that can get them out of Egypt. God says, unless you get to your man of God, you ain't going nowhere fast. In fact, you've been where you're going. Would you touch your neighbor if you're glad you got a man of God and you know who he is? Would you touch your neighbor and say, thank God for my man of God? By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet, a man of God, he was preserved. Now, he is a day because he, uh, Israel here, is Jacob. Now, if I had time, remember, Jacob was the serger, which means your surge was connected, watch this, to your ability to follow the words of the man of God. By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. By a prophet, he, he is really a they. Because Jacob, was the, uh, whose name was later changed to Israel, he was the patriarch, he was the leader of the Israelites. But so when it says he, it's really talking about they. So he is a they, but they is a he. And they as a nation were a nation of sergers. 
A surge, in case you don't know, is a sudden, powerful, forward, or upward movement. Would you look over at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you, but there's a surge in my life, and I'm right smack dab in the middle of it. And somebody said, Bishop, it don't feel like it. That's how you know you're in it. You didn't hear what I said. That's how you know you're in it. Bishop, what do you mean? The scripture says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The scripture says, don't you grow weary in well-doing, because in due season, you're going to reap if you faint. But if you feel weary, that's proof that the surge has started. Because you look, look at your neighbor and say, that's my proof. If you were crying this morning, that's your proof. If you were stressed out last week, that's your proof. Just your neighbor say, the surge has begun. All right, but watch this. Now, watch this, watch this, watch this. Hebrew, uh, Hosea 12, 13. By man of God, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. By man of God, uh, uh, he was, or they were, preserved. Now, preserved means kept, protected, and directed. Now, I need you to check this out. God always starts a new era in your life through the mouth of your man of God. I'll say it again. God always starts a new era in your life through the mouth of your man of God. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. That's page 406 in my Bible. So, do the math. Uh, 1 Samuel 9 and 1. We're going to look at a few scriptures here, and then you're going to shout. Now, if you don't shout and catch it, that's not coming out of my preaching time. 1 Samuel 9 and 1. There was a man, Benjamin, whose, uh, whose name was Kiss, the son of Abiel, the son of Zero, the son of Becherath, the son of Ephiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. Say Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than all of the people. Verse 3, now the donkeys of Kish say all his donkeys. Now, in Hebrew culture, donkeys were tantamount to like a Rolls Royce. So he lost all his roles in one day. And I think he had a phantom, he had ghosts, all in one day. Now, just side note, that would be a stressful day. Now, that's one thing for somebody to take one car. They took all his cars in one day. And Kish said to his son Saul, please take one of the servants with you and arise and go look for the donkey. So he passed through the mountains. So he started looking for him. They kept looking for him. We go down to verse 6. They keep looking for him. They couldn't find him. So they couldn't find him. Verse 6. And he said to him, look now, there is in this city a man of God. And he is an honorable man, and all he says surely comes to pass. Let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. Touch your neighbor and say, we're going somewhere. They said, we lost our stuff. We don't know where it's at. Rather than wandering around hoping and wishing, let's just go ask the man of God. Rather than trying and hoping and I don't want to get this decision wrong. So, well, well, uh, touch your neighbor and say, just go ask the man of God. All right, now watch this. Watch this. Look what it says. Uh, verse 7, then Saul said to the servant, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present or gift to bring the man of God. What do we have? They knew in the Hebrew culture, you did not go to the man of God empty-handed. Because if you tried to draw on the gift without sowing seed in reciprocation for what you were drawing, even what he spoke wouldn't come to pass because you were illegally making a withdrawal. Get the CD. Verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here one-fourth of a shekel of silver. We will give that to the man of God for him to tell us our way. Look at verse 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer, a man of God, for he's now called a prophet. He was formerly called a seer. Verse 10. Then Saul said to the servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Notice they went to him. So some people, you know, uh, well, let me leave that alone. See, some of your friends, now it's good you give them CDs and stuff, but some of your friends, they're like, oh, I go over here, but I get fed by Bishop Foreman. Okay, well, you don't get to, you don't get to eat at Ruth's Chris and go pay McDonald's. All right, all right, verse 11. As they went up the hill of the city, they met some young women going out to draw water uh, and said to them, is the seer here, the man of God here? And they answered them and said, yes, he is just ahead of you. Hurry now, because today is, uh, he's come to this city because there's a sacrifice uh, of the people today uh, in the high place. Now, say they found the man of God. Now, look here. Go to uh, verse number 15. Now, the Lord uh, had told Samuel in his ear the day before uh, Saul came saying, tomorrow about this time, I'm going to send you a young man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander or king or prince or ruler over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is. 
the man whom I spoke to you, the one who reigned over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me, where's the man of God said? Samuel, now he didn't even know he was talking to the man of God. Samuel said, I'm the man of God. He said, get in front of me, go to the high place, watch this, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go, and I'm going to tell you everything that's on your mind. He says, every, put the verse up, everything that's in your heart, he says, in your heart, heart in Hebrew is lev, which means mind. Now watch this, look at verse 20. Now, what, did, what, did the, what were they going to the man of God for? Some donkeys. What he didn't know is that in his obedience to go to the man of God, the man of God, he wanted donkeys, the man of God had a crown. You wanted to get your rent paid, God wanted you out of debt. You're not, all right, all right, all right, all right. watch. Look at verse 20. Oh, by the way, he says, as for those donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't worry about them, they've been found. He said, that ain't even what you're here for. You thought you came to me for that, but there's a whole other plan working behind the scenes. Why? Because I'm getting ready to announce a new era in your life. What, what, what's this? What's this? Look, look, look at verse, look at verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 1. I told you we're going to look at it a lot tonight. Uh, verse 1. Then Samuel took out a, a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? His inheritance here means Israel. All right. Well, when you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb. Uh, touch your neighbor and say, He's anointed. But he came for donkeys all right now look look go down to verse uh, number five after that you should come to the hill of god where the philistine garrison is and it will happen when you come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a string instrument a tambourine a flute and a harp before them and they will be prophesied look at verse six then the spirit of the lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be turned into another man you missed it what was the point we're dealing with? It's a new era. When he got to the man of God, the man of God announced to him that your days of chasing donkeys, now I could play with that for a moment, but your days of chasing, okay, I could play with that for a moment because King James called donkeys another word. Okay, but he said your days of chasing that are over. I'm announcing a new era in your life. And Samuel said from this day forward, you're going to be a whole nother man. Would you touch your neighbor and say it's a new era in my life? That's why you came to Harvest. That's why I'm your pastor. Because I'm here to announce a new era in your life. And it is the era of the kingdom. Somebody shout glory. What's this? God always starts a new era with the man of God. Now, if you can't read that story, go down to verse 11. Now, this is going to shout you too. And it happened when everybody that used to know him from back in the day. That's what some of y'all dealing with now. You changed. Sure did. <laughs> you don't act the same. Sure don't. You think you're better than me. Uh, you think I'm better than you. Why don't you just say it? Y'all not. Touch your neighbor and say, I sure did change. And I'm proud about it. Tell him, because it's a new era in my life. Let me stop. Look what they said. When they saw that he prophesied among the prophets. Now remember, he was chasing donkeys. See, if y'all say amen, I wouldn't have to. Now King James calls donkey another word. But I don't want to have to edit the CD. But it's in the Bible. <sighs> that the people said to one another, what is it that has come upon this son of Kish? Is he among the prophets now? They were like, who do you think he is? Why are he acting like it's a new era or something? Why is he acting like he's surging? Why he acting like that? Three months ago, we was at the club together. Why he acting like that? A few months ago, we smoking together. Why they acting like that? A few months ago, they were depressed, about to commit suicide. Why they acting like that? It's because the man of God announced it's a new era. Watch. Verse 12, then a man from another answer said, okay, but who's his father? 
Say the man of God. Man of God. All right, got to move on. No, got to move on. Say it's a new era in my life. See, see now, so when I announce that to you, don't just write that down and just say, oh, that's nice. You be saying, say your name. Say, I receive that. Say, I'm walking in that. And I told you what the era is. It's the era of the kingdom. Who God says you are, what God says you can have. And this particular year, it ain't going to take that long to get there because this is the year of the church. Now believe that and put a praise on that. And I feel it right here because you're not next, you're now. I said, you're not next, you're now. Just your neighbor say, I'm right now. That's why the devil can't stop you, no matter what he's thrown against you, because it's a new era. Number two, your preparation has a purpose. I got five minutes, my goodness. Nino and the Cash Money Brothers became the dominant drug ring in New York City, but nobody thought they'd be able to succeed. Now, I was clear with you, from a biblical point, they were not successful, so they were not successful. But there's a principle I want you to see because Nino CMB was a group of misfits and people without sufficient education and experience with the issues they'd been through in life was preparation to build a million dollar week operation. And I told you in part one, this is what God has always done. He takes inexperienced and flawed people and by his grace, somebody say grace. He uses them to do great things, and he plans to do the same thing with you. Not one tear will be wasted. Not one day will be wasted. Not one storm will be wasted. Not one betrayal will be wasted. Not Say nothing's going to be wasted. Bishop, how do you know it won't be wasted? Because we serve the God that can take two fish and five loaves of bread and somehow get use out of that to feed thousands of people. He's not wasteful. He likes abundance, but he doesn't like waste. Touch your neighbor say, nothing will be wasted. That's why you can't have bitterness against the people that hurt you because God says, I'm going to use that too. That's why you can't be mad against the people that betrayed you. God says, I'm going to use that too. Nothing will be wasted. Your preparation introduces you to Nino Brown. Say, my inner... Nino. Now, now, if you've seen the movie, like, is it? Oh, wait a minute. I told you in part one, the word Nino in its original language means God's grace. And the word brown in color psychology means structure, order, and truth. So Nino Brown means grace and truth, grace and order, grace and structure. When you went through the hell you went through, you found out about his grace. But you also learned the truth about you, and you found out the areas of your life that were out of order. Do I have some witnesses in here? And while you looked at his grace, you were also thankful for his truth. And that's why John 1.17 says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, when you go through stuff in life, it's preparation and it's purposeful. Say, it's preparation and it's purposeful. And God gives us grace. Say, grace and truth. So grace then becomes our incentive to be better, not to remain in error. So when you look back over your life, you ought to say, and you hear me say it all the time, but it's so true. While I may not be where I want to be, I'm super, here's another word, uber thankful that I'm not where I used to be. Grace says that I'm still progressing. Truth says that I'm better than I was. All right, number three. I told you, don't play with yesterday. Say, don't play with yesterday. Pookie, who was played by Chris Rock, was a crackhead that was put in rehab. And as he recovers, he offers to help bring Nino down. And against his better judgment and the disapproval of his leadership, Scotty, played by Ice-T, makes Pookie an informant. But Pookie dies at the hand of what Pookie was delivered from because while he was out of Egypt, Egypt wasn't out of him. Because coming out of Egypt happens in a moment, but Egypt coming out of you takes time. Say, it takes time. Flip to Numbers 32. Flip to Numbers 32. Numbers 32. I want to show you something. I want you to understand what's been going on in your life. Because you've been calling the devil. God says it's been a test. You've been rebuking and binding. God says, I'm trying to deal with you. Let me help you. All right. All right. That's page 249 in my Bible. Numbers 32, 13. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness. How long? How long? Until all the generation that had done evil in his sight was dead, was gone. Now, look at me. 
Now notice the, the Bible uses, just put the verse up for one more moment so we can see this. The Bible uses the word gone. Now literally what took place is that generation of people that thought that way, they died out. But say, somebody said there's a deeper point. God needed that mindset and mentality in them to die. And 40 is the biblical number of testing. This is what he's trying to say. So the way God sees if you change is to test you with it to see if you were delivered from it. I'm going to say that again. God tests you with it to see if you were delivered from it. Because you don't know if you're free from it until you're tested by it. Now watch this. It took 40 years for Egypt to come out of them. And Egypt, say Egypt. Egypt, bad mentalities, bad processes, rebellion, disobedience. I'm going to do my own thing because I'm grown, yet you ain't got no grown people fruit. All that? All right, all that? God says, the way I test, the way I get that up out of you is I test you. But Bishop, why does the Lord test me? Because that's his way of doing it. Why, why do they test you before you can go into law school? They need to know you know something. It's nice that you say you know something, but the only way to prove you know something is to pass the Right now, your neighbor's in a test. And God says, now you better pass this thing because you didn't got enough lessons to where you ought to be able to pass this thing with flying colors. Touch your neighbor so you better pass this thing. That's how he knows Egypt is out of you. Now watch this. Pookie, we talked about is like this woman, Mary Magdalene from the Bible. Magdalene wasn't her last name. It was the place she was from. She was Mary from Magdala. Magdala coincidentally means great place or from a giant place or from a magnificent place. Uh, watch this. She relapsed after being set free and she messed up big more than once. And we know this. I'm just going to review Mark 16, 9, because scripture says when he uh, arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to who? Mary Magdalene, out of him who had cast what? Seven demons. Now, which is interesting because Jesus could have appeared to anybody first. He chose her. And what I love about it is he chose the imperfect person to appear to first. Don't you let yourself or people tell you, but well, God ain't going to do nothing with you because you got issues and you ain't perfect. As long as you're faithful, I'm going to tell you you're exactly who he wants. See, I'll, I'll take a Mary before I take a Peter any day. Because Mary's grateful. Mary's just happy to be there. Peter's arrogant and thinks somebody owe him something, which is why he had to go down to the... Now watch this. Watch this. Out of whom he had cast seven demons. After years of following Jesus, at the end of the story, the number of unclean spirits are mentioned. And we learned that in Luke 11 and 24 through 26, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to the house from whence I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in what? Order. So now do you see the significance of the previous point? Grace and truth. Nino Brown. Grace and structure, order, and truth. So look what it says, verse 25. And when he comes out, he finds it swept, and he finds Nino. Come on, class. Verse 26. Then he goes. Because watch this. He's like, well, we can't come at him the way we came at him last time. They're expecting us to come through the front door. What they're not expecting is for us to come in through the air vent. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. See, that's why some of you, you don't even realize you're in the same test this year. You were in the same time last year because it didn't come through the front door. It came through the air vent. You're not hearing me. Some of you in the exact same test as before, but this time as your man of God, I declare since you're in a new era, this time you pass it. This time, this, this, this time you pass it. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm passing it this time. Look, then he goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and they dwell there. How did they get in if everything was in order? Because he was not expecting him to come this way. Because last time you had the test, you, you like, you know, you, you know, it was raining all day. But this time it was sunny and hot. So you didn't even see that it's the same thing from last time, just a different way. Yep, they ain't talking. All right. All right. Notice, and they enter and dwell there in the last state of the man is worse than the first. Now, I told you this. If you were blank, whatever the blank is, rebellious, out of order, disobedient, didn't do what the word says, all that, don't play with it. Somebody say don't play with it because it comes back stronger. 
And this is why you see some people rebound and rebound and rebound, but because they keep playing with it, it, it becomes more difficult to beat later. This is why you had some friends and all that, and they had trust issues, and y'all were breaking through trust issues, and all of a sudden, this thing opened back up, and now you're like, they didn't went crazy, Bishop. How'd they go crazy? They went crazy because it came back seven times stronger. And the Bible says the last state's worse than the first state. But what I love about Jesus, even, so the principle of this was that Mary had messed up more than once because we, Jesus, the scripture numbers how much he had to cast out of her. So we know that she had messed up more than once because the only way they had a right to be there is that she opened the door again. All right, did you catch that? You see this? Now, anybody in here messed up more than once? Look at your neighbor and say, you have, and tell them I have too. But what I love about Jesus is even though Mary had messed up big more than once, somewhere in private, I gotta say it again. I said it on Sunday, but I gotta say it again. Jesus cast out her mess in private so that she could be a success in public. And I love the God that I serve because he'll take me in the back room and deal with me in private so that I don't make a fool of myself in public. Would you shake your neighbor's arm like you're going to shake it off and say, thank God he did it in private. Everybody in here got some junk, got some drama, got some issues, got, got some stuff that God said, I ain't going to put you out there like that. I'm going to deal with you in private. Luke 8, 3 tells us that Mary is one of Jesus' most dedicated and loyal followers, and she was one of his greatest givers because grateful people are great givers. And I know our church is full of grateful people because we are great givers. I said, I know our church is full of grateful people because we're great givers. What I love about the people of Harvest is we ain't got to kill chickens and murder fish to get stuff done. We're grateful people around here. And because we're grateful, that means we're great givers. Would you just shout out, say, I'm a great giver. And I'm not just talking about money, although I am talking about money. I'm also talking about serving. I'm also talking about making sure the vision comes to pass. I'm also talking about inviting people to church. We are great people because we're great givers, but we're great givers because we're grateful. Somebody holler, I'm grateful. Number four, you're going to reap what you're sowing. Scotty, ice, played by Ice-T, revealed that Nino had killed his mother as a teen. And after being captured, Nino is sentenced to one year in jail. And it looks like he's not going to pay for what he's done. But as Nino is speaking with reporters outside the courtroom, and I said this, and I don't know which experience I'm going to say it again. What God often lets people do is think they got away with, with doing the, his people wrong. He lets them go get new cars. <laughs> He lets them go get new stuff. He lets them go do this. He lets them go do that. He says, go on, get your do, do you, baby. Because look, if I would have taken it from you when you had nothing, it'd just be Tuesday for you. But you shouldn't have messed with my church, and you shouldn't have messed with my people, and you shouldn't have messed with the man of God. Bishop, who is the church? We are the church. <laughs> you shouldn't have messed with us, because what I'm getting ready to do is let you get something. So when I come back around for judgment, I have something to take. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't have to go around getting even. You don't have to go around plotting against people. You just keep being faithful and watch God get them. Yeah. What's this? What's this? As Nino gets arrogant, popping his collar, like I got away with this. I did what I wanted to do, and I got away with it. One of the men that Nino had snubbed off comes and takes Nino's life and Nino falls over the balcony to his death and the principle I wanted us to understand is be ready to reap it if you sow it because Galatians 6 7 do not be deceived God will never be mocked in other words God says if I let you treat my church any kind of way and I let you treat the man of God any kind of way and I let you treat my who's the church we are if I let you treat them any kind of way you're mocking me God says and God says I'm not the God to be played with I ain't a trick tricks are for kids God says if you mess with my people you will not mock me and I will come back around to see you I just wanted you to think you got away with it now, somebody said, Bishop, why should you be shouting? Because there's some of you in here that have been mad at God because you thought he let people do you wrong and get away with it. Well, I got an announcement to make to you. God says, I will not be mocked. I will not be played. If you play with my children, I'm coming to see you. 
Touch your neighbor and say, that's my God. That's my God. That's my God. You ain't got to get mad at him. You ain't got to get angry at him on Facebook. You ain't got to get angry on him on Instagram. You ain't got to get angry with him on Twitter. Just keep on blessing and stepping, blessing and stepping, blessing and stepping. Why? Because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Number five, I'm done. Division is dangerous. This is the new one. Division is dangerous. Now, again, Nino and the CMB, we all we got. Am I my brother's keeper? So, yeah, I forgot. This is Denver. So your response is, yes, I am. Is that, okay. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. All right. Now, brother also means sister. And by the way, brother, it's not a racial thing. Look at the person next to you and say, yes, I am. So one more time. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. All right, good. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. What does that mean? It just means, watch this. And this is important, Harvest. We're, we're one team. You understand that? Not, it's, one order, it's one owner. And his name is Jesus the Christ. And it's but one head coach. Now, now, everybody else, touch your neighbor and say, play your role. Catch the ball. Now, there's some of y'all ain't receivers. You block. I need you to block and stop getting mad because you ain't a receiver. I don't hear nobody talking to me. We are one team, and we ain't going to be divided and messed up and got clicks. and That ain't happening up in here because we got too much work to do. Touch your neighbor and say, am I my brother's keeper? Say, yes, I am. We will not have division. We will not have drama. We will not have clicks. We will not have attitudes. We will not have sister girl. We will not have sister boy. And none of that mess is happening up in here because we got a war to win and I only fight to win. Somebody holler, yes! Well, I'm offended because you're immature. Take several seats and get unoffended. But stop talking about how much you love God and you live, I don't love God. You're, no, and then you're getting offended and not coming to church. You need to grow your little tail up. Just let me say, grow your little tail up. Now, if they don't say it like that, I'm going to go to the South for a moment. Because in the South, we wouldn't show grow your little tail up. We talk a little stronger. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, the CMB, they weren't successful according to God's standards, but I want to teach you another principle through what we see happen in the movie. Because his right-hand man, G-Money, led to the downfall of their disorganization because he became distracted with a skeezer. A ske That's what he called her. Let me tell you single people something. You wonder why God won't send you an answer? Because you get distracted with skeezers. And you get distracted, you get distracted and excited about nothing. You're not saying nothing to me. God says, why would I send you what you've been praying for and you get distracted by an imitation? Seven. Okay, I feel like preaching through here. Seven counterfeits showed up before David, who was the eighth son, showed up, which means normally the first few of them ain't the right ones anyhow. They look the part, but they're not the part. They're counterfeits. And I'm sick and tired of single folk getting distracted because of Match.com and ChristianMingle.com and you're leaving your church and your man of God to go chase some tail and you're not saying anything to me. And you're ruining your life behind somebody that's going to be gone by Christmas. Say amen to that. You sitting here ain't serving because you're running behind some. Say, I'm not scared of you, Denver. Sit there all you want like this here. Ain't nobody stunning you. I ain't from around here. And another thing. G Money, sit down. Put it up. This G Money. What's his real name? Alan Payne. G Money, G Money 
didn't realize that the attention he was getting wasn't because of him. It was because he was close to Nino. And the skeezer didn't want G-Money. The skeezer wanted Nino the whole time. Somebody said, Bishop, what's a skeezer? That's what they called a woman who had another motive the whole time. Don't you get it twisted? All the folks showing up in your life, it ain't because of you. It's because now you're next to the surge. You're next to the anointing. You're next to the kingdom. And honey attracts flies. Don't you get distracted. Touch your neighbor and say, don't get distracted now. So G Money got distracted by this one girl who her whole agenda was to get to Nino. G Money got distracted. Touch your neighbor and say, don't get distracted. G Money got distracted because all of a sudden he thought it was him that made CMB. He didn't realize it was Nino that had made CMB. G Money got distracted. And watch this, you still here? He gets distracted, and now he starts using the product he was selling. So his loyalty becomes divided because he's distracted. So distractions cause divisions. I said distractions cause divisions. And you gotta be careful because G-Money went out and made a side deal on Nino. He thought that them coming to him was because they wanted him. They didn't know that the whole game was to get. See, Judas thought that the high priest liked him. Judas didn't know that the only reason they liked him was because they wanted to get to Jesus. Don't confuse attention, people. Don't confuse it. They're trying to take your gift. They're trying to get to your anointing. They're trying to get to your grace. They're trying to get to your favor. Delilah only shows up when you're getting ready to break through, Samson. I'm talking to somebody in here. You tell my show and so showed up. Because you're about to surge. And the only way the surge could get broken is Satan had to get you distracted so he could get you divided. Oh, but I speak it into your life tonight that you will not be distracted and you will not be divided. Touch your neighbor and say, I speak that over your life. 1 Corinthians 11 and 18. Now, first, I want to show you that there's actually, I, I want to show it to you from a, from a corporate standpoint. I got to move. 1 Corinthians 11 and 18. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible. For in the first place, when you assemble as a congregation, I heard that there are cliques, divisions, and factions among you. And look at what Paul says. And I, in part, believe it. This is, I'm reading the Amplified uh, from what Paul is saying to his children at the church of Corinth. Say Corinth. I said, don't say it like you're from Denver, Corinth. <laughs> say it like you're from Deep South. Say Corinth. All right, there you go. Like Coca-Cola. Say Coca-Cola. I like a Coca-Cola, please. What is that? You mean a Coca-Cola? Come on, come on. Y'all going to be Southern before it's all done. Y'all going to be nice to people before it's said and done. I promise you. <laughs> look at this. But look at verse 19. Now, from a corporate standpoint. See, anybody has some folk act crazy with you the last few months? Anybody, somebody you thought was on your team? Middle of the game, they switched jerseys. Who, who am I preaching to? All right, let me tell you why that happened. Look at verse 19. For doubtless there have to be factions amongst you or parties among you in order that they who are genuine and of approved fitness may become evident and plainly recognized among you. Let me read New King James. Leave it up. For there must be factions among you. Factions means divisions. So that you can see who's really with you and who's not. So division actually has a hidden gift. The gift is I get to see who's really been on my team. And then I get to see the fair weather fans because everybody around you ain't for you. Everybody eating your food ain't for you. Everybody riding in your car ain't for you. Y'all not saying nothing to me. Everybody you taking out to eat after church, they are not for you. So Paul said you needed to see these. And that's why I can look back over the last nine years and say thank you, Jesus for showing me who was really with me and who was not. Paul said they had to go out from us so that those that were of us could be manifest to us. 
because if they had been of us, they'd still be with us. And I'm glad I got a church full of people. Can I hoop right here like a Baptist preacher? Is there anybody? Is there anybody? And you're on the harvest team. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad about it. Is there anybody in here that you're glad you're part of this team? We are a united team. We're not a divided team. All right, I got to finish. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. Okay, I got to finish. I got to finish. Romans 16, 17. So, so, so watch this. So the reason that had to happen is so that you stop paying for their food. So you stop giving them rides. So let me talk over here. They ain't saying that. that had to happen so that while you defending them, the other people, and they behind the scenes breaking you down and lying on you. Touch your neighbor say it had to happen. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad he told me down here so I didn't find that out up here. Oh! So Paul says, Paul says while it hurt, it was good. While it, while it hurt, touch your neighbor say it did hurt, but it was good for me. I know you cried some tears. But now it's time to wipe those tears and say thank you. I ain't even mad no more. I needed you to do me like that so that I knew not to fool with you no more. I needed you to do me like that so that I found out that you really weren't for me. I needed you to do me like that so that I wouldn't pick another friend like you. I needed you to do me like that so that I wouldn't let you. All right, all right, all right, all right. I got to finish. Romans 16 and 17. Romans 16 and 17. Shout about that. Shout out. Romans 16 and 17. It's going to be prayer time in a minute. It's going to be prayer. But it ain't, it ain't yet, though. It ain't yet, though. It ain't yet, though. But in a minute, something about to break in here. Bitterness is about to break over your life. God says it was good that it happened to you. Romans 16 17. I got to finish. Now, I urge you, brethren. That means that's biblical talk for church folk. Look at the name. That's you. He says, note or mark the people who cause division. Now, who's he talking to? Church folk. So what was he telling the church folk to do? Mark the ones that don't do what they told. And then let them have several seats. And if they leave, to hell with them. Because we will not be, oh yes, what I just said. Because if you're in here trying to cause division and trying to stir up mess and trying to stir up controversy and trying to turn people against one another, you are in the way. He says, this is, Paul, uh, this is the writer of Romans, excuse me. He says, mark them. Touch your neighbor and say, mark them. Those who cause divisions and offenses contrary watch this to the things you learned watch and avoid them so for all of y'all who got people well you know i'm good at harvest no more because you know i just don't understand why you know i have to serve both experiences the bible tells me that i shouldn't talk to you no more it's quiet in here oh it's quiet in here well, why, all that teaching on honor, I just don't, you know, I grew up in the church. Well, why did, why are you growing up in the church didn't make you have all them different baby daddy then? I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. You got all this church experience. Why your life don't look like it? My daddy was a pastor. Well, evidently, he should have whooped you another time. Say amen to that. The Bible says... I should stay away from people who are contrary to what I'm taught. And I do it the same way with my bishop. If somebody says something to me about my bishop, I'll be like, we are not friends anymore. Don't call me. No, man, I'm just saying. No, you ain't just saying that to me. I will cut you. You don't know who you're messing with. That's my man. That man saved my life. That man kept me from taking. You will not do that to him. Oh. Look, it's just loud in there. That's why I don't go. We ain't talking no more then. The Bible says I should avoid them. No, 
you ain't Facebook friends. Block and delete. Block and delete. Block and delete. Delete and block. Private. This is Bible. This ain't Bishop. This is Bible. The moment you got a problem with my man of God is the moment you have a problem with me. Verse 18. Verse 18. Come on, verse 18. For those who are such, who are such? People who cause division, come against what you're taught. Do not serve Jesus, but their own stomach. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive simple-minded people. Just your neighbor say, I'm not simple. You do know what simple means. Simple means stupid, dumb as a box of rocks unlearned, lacking a level of erudite consciousness. <laughs> Why y'all say sir and ma'am? Why y'all do all of that? Because we're people of honor. Why don't they let you sit where you want to sit? Because we need the seat. Well, I called Bishop directly, and Bishop didn't call me back. Baby, we get thousands of calls every month. Now, what they told you to do was come see me out there. So if you're too good to come out there, well, why do you got to wait in line? Because we got a line. What you want me to do? I can't be on the phone all day talking to you because you don't want to do what I preach. I got to take over, and I can't take over on the phone all day with you, with your non-listening self. Somebody shout yes. Well, I'm never going back. Don't threaten me with a good time. That's exciting. Because I'll take a Mary. Okay, I got to finish this. Bert, something was in this atmosphere. Now, I don't know what they put in what I ate before church, but something. Glory to God. Well, uh, verse 19. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Look at this. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. How? Because you're obedient to what you're taught and you don't let divisive people come in and say nothing to cause division. He says, so the only way Satan gets crushed is when you obey. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Somebody say, that's Bible. Just that simple. That's Bible. That's Bible. That's, that's, that's Bible. Now, since, since I'm a few minutes over, flip to Nehemiah. I might as well. Uh, uh, go on, on over to Nehemiah chapter 4. Go on to Nehemiah chapter 4. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you something because Nehemiah had to deal with this. See, throughout the years of the church, division would try to come in because Satan said, I can't prevail against the church, so I need church folk to just turn on one another. Because if they do it, the gates of hell can't win. Who's the church? We are. Church is people. So, so since I can't prevail against them, I need them to destroy one another. Which is why Christian people, somebody going to send in a question, Bishop, did you preach against this? I said, well, let's start with your stuff. Let's start with you. I said, you want to know? I said, because you don't want to know what I really preach. It. You want to start a fight. And the problem is, you don't come, if you're going to come fight with me, I'm Mufasa. So you better have some teeth big as mine because I'm not the one for that. Do you preach against this? Do you preach You don't want to know the truth. You want to start a fight. And so if you want to start a fight, let's start with your stuff. Let's start with you. 
Just your neighbor, say, don't start with somebody else. Start with yourself. You know why so many folk in other folk business? It's because they ain't got none of their own business. And you need to go get you some business and start handling your own business so you can get up out of everybody else's business. Well, Bishop, so-and-so's doing this. But what about you doing? Why you got time to figure out what they doing? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go there then. All right, fine. Since y'all ain't going to say nothing, go to Galatians 6.1. Let me help your neighbor out. Now, this was going to be in Sunday's message. It's still going to be in. Y'all better shout on Sunday like you didn't read the verse. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if somebody got an issue, if you say you're spiritual, be kind. Before you become what you judge. See, for everybody that said, I'll never do that, didn't never teach you a lesson. For everybody that said, I'm, uh, let me tell you, you judgmental people, touch your neighbor, so you better stop that. Because Galatians says, we're going to look at it on Sunday. I just need to go there just real quick since I'm in this in the house. He says, because, he says, you're going to become what it is you judge. So when you're condemning other people, you better be careful because you're going to be what you're judging. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4. All right, we're talking about division. Say, I rebuke division. No, say it like you're serious. Say, I rebuke division. All right, Nehemiah 4.1. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he was furious, and he was indignant, and so he mocked them. It's some folk right now that's mad that you're talking about surgeon. And while you, while, while they smiling on your job, they secretly thinking, I can't stand you. Watch this. And here's the trip. Some of them, your family. And what you don't understand is, I thought you were supposed to be happy for me. I thought you were supposed to encourage me. Why are you my number one opposition? And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? He said, they don't look like they can do this. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they complete in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. He said, whatever they build, even if a fox come against it, he's going to break down their stone wall. They're basically doing an old school kind of like hater session. So they're like, it don't matter what they try to do. It ain't going to work. That's what he's saying. You got it? You got it? Verse 4, hear our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their heads and give us to them to plunder a land of captivity. Now, go down to verse uh, 6. Now, Nehemiah, long story short, Nehemiah goes to the king. He's the king's cupbearer, uh, which means, watch this, his service got him access to a place that, that watch this, he was a cupbearer, but he had access to the king. Which means serving gives you access to the king. You, you know the person... In your, on your job right now, do you know the most important person when it comes to access to your building? The janitor. Because he's got keys to every door. Serving gives you access. Okay, but watch this. Watch this. That's a separate thing. But watch this. Look at verse 6. This is Nehemiah. He gets access. They go back. He's trying to rebuild the wall of his city that had been burnt down. It was left in ruins. He's trying to rebuild it. And Sanballat hears about this. And Sanballat gets furious. He's mad. He's angry. And look at verse 6. This is Nehemiah talking. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together about half its height. Say it was halfway done. <laughs> Interesting. I'm uh, Maybe something like, I'm kind of close to like halfway through the year maybe or something like that. For the people had a mind to work. Say, I have a mind to work. Now look at verse, uh, look at verse 7. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry. These people are surging and they're angry about it. They no longer are caring that so-and-so got an attitude with them and they're mad about that. Some people do stuff because their attention. Let me clean that second word up. Hormonglers. And so they do this stuff because they really want to pull you into their stuff. And now that you don't keep getting pulled into their stuff, they mad. I think I got a few witnesses in here. So they do all this dramatic stuff because they're trying to pull you into their stuff. So here's what happens. So look. Look at verse 8. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem. Look at this. And create confusion. Division. Distractions. Look at verse number 9. Nevertheless, we had prayer time. 
And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night of the labor, uh, 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 verse 10. Then Judah said, then praise said, our strength is failing because there's so much rubbish. Rubbish means foolishness, distractions, divisions, that we're not able to build the wall. So we're distracted, so we're not building. Look at verse 11. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause their work to cease. But I like Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah had the spirit of Bishop in him. He had the spirit of Jacob in him. He had the spirit of a surge in him. He had the spirit of a new era in him. Because look at what he says in verse 13. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, the leaders, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren. Say, I am my brother's keeper. Your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Look at this. And it happened where our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing. An enemy is anything that opposes your port forward progress. He says, and when they found out, watch this. Look, hold, hold on one second. Watch this. Watch this. And it happened. Because I want to hear this. And then, and then they're going to shout. Watch this. And it happened. Say it happened. When our enemies heard that we knew that God wasn't going to let them win. All you need to do is just know. Not hearing me. Look at the neighbor and say, you know. All you need to know is that if God be for you, who can be against you? All you need to know is that you're being made the head and not the tail. Touch your neighbor and say, all you need to do is know. What's this? And when they found out we knew that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us would turn to the wall, everybody to his work. You, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> I said, you don't understand. I said, you don't understand. Division tried to creep in. Distraction creeped in. Because distractions cause divisions. Confusion tried to creep in. But Nehemiah said, all we did was just know. That no weapon that is formed is going to be able to prosper. Look at the neighbor and say, just know it, just know it, just know it. And we went back to work. But look at this, look at verse 17. But when they went back to work, look how they went. Then we're going into prayer time. Verse 17, those who built on the wall say, I'm building. I'm building. Say, I'm surging. I'm surging. But look, and those who carried burdens, talking about bricks and different materials for the wall, loaded themselves. Look at this. So with one hand, they worked at construction. But with the other hand, they had a weapon. Which means, I'm surging, but I might cut you. I'm surging, but I'm fighting. I'm fighting, and I'm surging. I'm surging, and I'm fighting. And I'm fighting, and, I, and you may knock me down, but I'm going to get right back up. And I might feel weary sometimes, but I'm going to get right back up. Because this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And harvest is prayer time. I said it's prayer time. The scripture says that in Nehemiah they prayed, and when they prayed, the Lord brought the plans of their enemies to nothing. So tonight, somebody holler tonight. Father, we break every plan that the enemy has set and every weapon that has been attempted to be formed. And in the name of Jesus, we cancel the formation of it. And we curse it at its root in the name of Jesus. An enemy is anything that opposes our forward progress. And tonight, holler tonight. And tonight, we render it powerless in the name of Jesus. But we declare just like Nehemiah, we got a sword in one hand and we're building with the other hand. We got a weapon in one hand and we're building with the other hand. I got praise in one hand and I got a seed in the other. I got joy in one hand and I got a seed in the other hand. I've got victory in one hand and I've got a mind to work in the other hand. And all we got to do tonight is just know. Somebody holler, I know that we're not fighting for the victory but we're fighting from the victory. And Harvest, for the next 60 seconds, I want you to give God your most radical praise possible. Give it to him.
Come on, if you're watching online, give it to him. All you got to do is know tonight, the words of the Lord shall not fall to the ground. You're fighting from the victory, not for the victory. You win. You win. You win. You win. Somebody holler, I win. I win. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. It's a new era. It's a new era. It's a new era. It's a new era. It's called kingdom. 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 Give him praise. Sickness has got to leave your body. Death's got to leave your house. Your children shall rise up to serve the Lord. They are mighty men and women of valor. We speak it in the name of Jesus. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to just grab somebody by the hand, wherever you're at. If you're at the altar, if you're out there, in the, in the, uh, we don't have pews, we don't have seats. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> it's a new era, y'all. That's why new folk, you want a new thing. And many of you, your whole circle is new. For some of you, the circle is just you. And that's a good thing. Because God says, I don't need you contaminated. So let me tell you what happens. When a woman gets ready to give birth, I remember when I was a little kid, a relative of mine was giving birth. And they were getting ready to give birth. And I was at the hospital. I was a little kid. I was happy about another little kid. And they said, you got to go. I said, why? They said, because you have a cough. And, and your cough might contaminate the baby. So for all of you who are like, Bishop, it's just me. Good. God says he don't want nobody <laughs> coughing on you. And you better learn to love you, enjoy you, take yourself to Ant-Man. Now I can save you some money. Wait till it come out on Redbox. Wait till it come out on Redbox. <laughs> save you $10. See, see, look at God. He'll save you money on the church. Don't, don't get distracted. The Lord said last week when I was gone, he said, son, keep the people focused. He said, don't let them get distracted. He said, because they don't even know that what's going on in the spirit far outweighs whatever little stuff they're dealing with over here. And he said, I need them focused, son. He said, because what I'm manifesting in their life he said, they great, 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 greats never even imagined it was going to be possible. They're going to be the first in their bloodline to possess. Father, tonight we seal this worship experience. And we speak strength now that you would be strong in the hand that we hold. That in their weakness, you would be made strong. In their confusion, your wisdom would be made clear. God, you've sent them here to turn them into another man. To turn them into another woman. It, it's been your way of doing things forever. You sent Saul to Samuel because while Samuel was busy chasing donkeys, as the King James calls something else, you had a king in him. So tonight, we seal this time. Squeeze that hand. You're winning. <laughs> Y'all don't know when to give God praise. Uh, you're winning. But Bishop, it felt like I lost. Keep reading. I 
at the beginning of chapter 4, it looked like Nehemiah's plans were stupid. He looked like a failure. Ooh, but if you keep reading. <laughs> Woo! God Almighty, if you keep reading. Somebody say, I'm going to keep reading. Encourage, encourage your, your brother and your sister next to you. Tell him, say, keep reading. Encourage that other person, say, keep reading. Say, we're winning. Say, we're winning. We're winning. Glory to God. Now tonight, 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 you got an hour and 45 of power. <laughs> we, we just got to change the name because we can't keep lying. I really mean to do it, but there's so much I want to give you. As your pastor, know my heart. I just, so much I want to give you. And yeah, it's, really my, it's really the truth. Because I want a church full of world changes and history makers. I want people to look at you and say, you must be one of them harvest people because all your stuff is together. You got money. Your credit is good. Your family is good. You must be one of them. That's what I'm going for. It's exactly what I'm going for. It's exactly what I want. Thank you. Thank you. How they say it now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, nobody moving. Tonight, if you're in this worship experience, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can drop that hand for a moment. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is your moment. I get so excited, and our whole church does, when we see those decisions. Because at the end of the day, that means we're alive, and Jesus is at work in our church. Harvest, we're a modern miracle. God, this doesn't happen for churches planted from scratch with nothing in nine years. Not in this city. It doesn't. We're a miracle. Look at your neighbor and say, you're part of a miracle. And you need to know that tonight. This is a miracle. What Jesus has done for us in this short amount of time in this city is a flat foot miracle. It is. It just is. We didn't go take nobody's foot. We didn't do no foolishness. We didn't play no games. We didn't, go do, we didn't do none of that. We started from the bottom. And he's been good to us. But now tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ, tonight is your night. And you've never become a Christian. This is your moment. 2,000 years ago, God stepped in the body. That body was named Jesus. That body died so you and I could have life and life more abundantly. Is it a moment I made mistakes? Great. We all have. Look at your neighbor and say, you too. In fact, your neighbor was planning on making one before they came to church. But tonight, the Lord just said, nah, nope. Your neighbor was getting ready to call a distraction after church. But the Holy Ghost just busted that. Who am I preaching to? It just busted that thing up. We ghost around here. I ain't guessing. Holy Ghost, that is. Secondly, if you've given your life to Jesus and you've not been faithful to him, Mary wasn't. She messed up big, but he loved her. And in private, I, I'm so excited about that piece because he took her over here and said, come here, Mary. He who dwells in the secret place. This is why Satan can't even find you. This is why your haters can't even find you, because you're hidden. And every time they try to, there's a scripture that says they were trying to come seize Jesus, but he slipped away so that they couldn't see him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll let you. Tonight, if you need to recommit yourself to Jesus, this is your night. On the count of three, if either one of those of you need to become a Christian, recommit yourself to Jesus. On the count of three, throw your hands up. And we're not going to judge you. We're not going to beat you down. But I need you to throw your hand up, and I need you to do it proud. Jesus said, if you deny him, he'll deny you. Don't play with him. He loves you. He's good to you. He cares about you. And he's never given up on you. And you know what? He won't walk out on you. I said he won't walk out on you. I said he won't walk out on you. If you feel far from God, guess who moved? By the one of those you need to become a Christian, recommit yourself to Jesus on the count of three. Throw that hand up. One, two, three. If that's you, throw that hand up. I see you. 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 Oh, come on, Harvest. Give God praise for every hand. I said, give, on a Wednesday night. On a Wednesday night. Now lay your hands on yourself. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Because of that belief, because of this confession, if this is my first time praying this, I am a Christian. 
If I was far from you, I'm reconnected to you. It's a new era in my life, the era of the kingdom. Wasted days are over. Wasted life is over. I've waited my whole life to get to this point, and I'm not next. I'm now in Jesus' name. Give God praise, everybody, everywhere. Tonight, tonight, 